मैम कोई नेपा यू आर रेडी शुरू करो यस मैम আমি আমাকে দেখা যাচ্ছে তো শোনাও যাচ্ছে আশা করছি यस मैम गुड इवनिंग एवरीबॉडी आई हैव द प्लेजर टू वेलकम यू ऑल टू दिस program which has been organized by Bethune College under the DBT Star College scheme to celebrate the National Science Day. Professor Mojumdar sir, I on behalf of all of us from Bethune College extend our warm and hearty welcome to you. We also extend our sincere gratitude to you for sparing your valuable time to be here with us. Every year 28th February is celebrated as the national science day to mark the discovery of raman effect by professor c v raman on 28th of february for his discovery on 28th of february 1928 he was awarded the nobel prize in physics or for his work in 1930 we in bethune college have organized a day long program first we had the department of computer science organizing an intra college online coding competition for our students in the morning there were 37 participants and 15 were short, uh, came were obviously came to the final competition or uh, they qualified for the final competition and uh, the i would like to over here to declare the names of the winners the first three position holders were Vidisha Shengupto from Semtri of Computer Science stood first securing 27.5 out of 300 Lavisha Sharma sorry Lavisha Sharma also from the Department of Computer Science from Sem1 secured 220 out of 300 and she stood second third third was the third position was secured by devoshmita bondopadhyay she was also she is also from computer science department and she is also a sem1 student and she secured 195 out of 300 the second program was organized by the department of botany of our college and they had an online program on biodiversity conservation and commitment it had two events one was the panel discussion and the second was an awareness program the third was just i have just completed the third but we have just completed the third program that is the publishing of an e magazine by the department of physics by the name of episteme with the uh, magazine has just been published by our principal ma'am and uh, she i'm very sorry she is very sorry and i'm also very sorry that she could not join with us today because she has other commitments and finally obviously we will end the celebration but we'll conclude the celebration with a talk from entitled sprints and hops the global journey of a mutant sars cov2 coronavirus and we will hear from professor our very esteemed speaker professor parthopi mojumdar national science chair government of india and he is the president of indian academy of science president of west bengal academy of science and technology distinguished professor and founder of national institute of biomedical genomics and emeritus professor of isi kolkata before we uh, hear from uh, professor p mojumdar our esteemed speaker i would request dr rupa pal department of mathematics to say a few words about our national science day over to rupa rupa thank you amita di good afternoon everyone good afternoon partho sir uh, today on national science day among the few programs organized at bethun college this is one program that we want to celebrate the day concluding almost ar ajker ei onusthane professor partho mojumdar er age kichu bolte chawa 
আমার মনে হয় এটা খুব বড় দুঃসাহসের কাজ দুঃসাহসের কাজটার মধ্যে খুব বেশি না গিয়ে ছোট করে আমাদের স্টুডেন্টদের জন্য যে কথাগুলি আমি বলতে চাইবো সেটা হচ্ছে আ ভেরি শর্ট অ্যাকাউন্ট অফ ওয়াই দিস ন্যাশনাল সায়েন্স ডে যুগান্তকারী আবিষ্কার রামান এফেক্ট এর আবিষ্কার তার সি ভি রামান করেছিলেন সেইটা মার্ক করে যেন আমরা ন্যাশনাল সায়েন্স ডে অবজার্ভ করি ইট ওয়াজ ইমপ্লিমেন্টেড দ্য নেক্সট ইয়ার উনিশশো সাতাশি সালে গভর্নমেন্ট অফ ইন্ডিয়ার এই প্রোগ্রামটি শুরু হয় এবং এই প্রোগ্রামটির থিম তখন থেকেই টার্গেটেড থিম ওয়াজ টু স্প্রেড অ্যান্ড অ্যাওয়ারনেস অফ সায়েন্স দিস ওয়াজ ওয়ে ব্যাক ইন Yes, sensitization of science and technology was necessary in masses at that point of time. Amra jani je proti din chokale uthe theke ghumote jawa porjonto ebong onek khetrei amader ghumie porar poreo kichu kichu scientific innovations amader proti muhurte kaaje lage. Sara din to oshongkho onek manusher kichu medicinal support lage. These are really scientific innovations. দুটো একটা ছোট্ট ঘটনা শেয়ার করব দেয়ার আর পিপল হু হ্যাভ স্লিপ অ্যাপনিয়া অ্যান্ড আদার সিমিলার ডিজিজেস আমাদের বায়ো সায়েন্সের যে টিচাররা আছেন বায়ো টেকনোলজির এই ইনোভেশনস গুলোর কথা জানেন দে টু রেস্কিউ পিপল অ্যান্ড হেল্প পিপল নট চোকিং দেম সেলস বাই স্লিপিং দেয়ার আর ডিভাইসেস তো দিস ইজ সায়েন্স টেকিং কেয়ার অফ আস more than our mind even when we are asleep so this part is one objective of this project of celebrating national science day uh, i'm sorry the project word is not the conventional word that i used uh, that is that has a simple meaning this time another aspect of this program of this targeted program was to give opportunities to scientific minded people as always to popularize science and technology and to display the achievements of field of science in human welfare ekhane amra ekta chotto kotha khub garber shonge e bochor bolte parchi je towards one year of this covid pandemic amader desh prothom shari she desh gulir moddhe ekti desh যারা এই মহামারী এবং তার সৃষ্টিকারী যে ভাইরাস সেই ভাইরাস কমব্যাক্ট করার জন্য যুগান্তকারী আবিষ্কারক দেশগুলির মধ্যে একটি যারা এর টিকা আবিষ্কার করেছেন উই আর প্রাউড টু বি ওয়ান অফ দোজ কান্ট্রিজ স্টার্টিং ফ্রম দ্য বিফোর ক্রাইস্ট এরাস হোয়াট উই প্রাউডলি কল বেদিক এরা সেই সময় থেকেই কিন্তু সাইন্টিফিক ইনোভেশন আমাদের দেশে বিভিন্ন রকম আছে আমরা জানি বহু আলোচিত কন্ট্রিবিউশন অফ জিরো ইন ম্যাথামেটিক্স দ্য আইডেন্টিফিকেশন অফ ইউনিট অফ এভরি অবজেক্ট দি অ্যাটম এবং আরো বেশ কিছু ক্লেম আছে যেগুলো আমরা এখনো এস্টাবলিশ করে উঠতে পারিনি আমাদের বেদিক যুগের সময় থেকে ক্যালকুলাস ইনফাইনাইটাল ক্যালকুলাস ইনফিনিটি এই আইডিয়াস গুলো এম্বেডেড ছিল আমাদের ইনোভেশনস এর মধ্যে আমাদের দেশের মানুষের ইনোভেশনস এর মধ্যে সেগুলো এস্টাবলিশ করা এখনো হয়নি এখনো এইগুলো বিদেশে বিভিন্ন জায়গার ইনোভেশনস এর মানুষের ইনোভেশনস এর নামেই রয়েছে সময় হয়তো এগুলো প্রকাশ পাবে আশা রাখি সেখান থেকে শুরু করে আজকে সার্স কোভিড ভাইরাসের টিকা পর্যন্ত ইট হ্যাজ বিন আ রিয়েলি গ্রেট অ্যান্ড ট্রায়ম্ফেন্ট জার্নি অফ দ্য ইন্ডিয়ান্স 
in the field of science and its applications. To the science and applications, er kotha bolne hai na. Research is the joining uh, part. Gato bochure research statistics of India. Bolche je amader deshe publications. Has remained in number and quality among the top five countries all over the world. Fifteen percent of the patents all over the world were filed from India in last two years. Research output from our country in Scopus journals since the last ten years has remained fifty percent. অর্থাৎ স্কোপাস জার্নালের পঞ্চাশ শতাংশ আমাদের দেশ থেকে পাবলিশড আর্টিকেলস এস সি আই এ থার্টি সিক্স এন এস এফ এইটি থ্রি পার্সেন্ট পাবলিকেশন আমাদের দেশ থেকে তাহলে বুঝে নিতে হবে কোনো একটা জায়গায় সায়েন্স ইনোভেশন সায়েন্টিফিক রিসার্চ যেমন বহু যুগ আগের থেকে আমাদের দেশে ইউনিফর্মলি এস্টাবলিশড কন্টিনিউস একটা প্রসেস রিসার্চ পাবলিকেশন কাউন্টার যেগুলি সেইগুলো কোনো একটা জায়গায় ुनिफर्मिटीफिकलफेयर बस कि नाम सोनमे এই একটা নামই করলাম এরকম আরো অনেক মানুষ আছেন আমরা জানি হি ইজ দ্য পার্সন হু হ্যাজ আপগ্রেডেড দ্য লাইফ অফ হিজ পিপল দ্য পিপল অফ লাদাখ কনসিডারেবলি বাই হিজ সাইন্টিফিক মাইন্ড আমরা আশা রাখি যে আমাদের দেশে আরো এরকম অনেক সেন্টার্স অনেক মানুষ অনেক লিডারশিপ সাইন্টিফিক লিডারশিপ তৈরি হবে যারা আস্তে আস্তে এই সাইন্টিফিক ইনোভেশন এর সাহায্যে আমাদের লাইফ আরো স্মুথ অ্যান্ড মোস্ট ইম্পর্টেন্টলি সেভিং দ্য নেচার করে উঠতে সাহায্য করবেন এক্ষেত্রে আর বেশি কথা বাড়ানোর দৃষ্টতা করছি না লেট মি কনক্লুড মাই ওয়ার্ডস অ্যান্ড পাস ইট ওভার টু অমিতা ম্যাডাম ফর উই অল আর ওয়েটিং ইগারলি টু হিয়ার ফ্রম পার্থ স্যার নাও থ্যাংক ইউ मजुमदार I would like to say a few words about him, and uh, trying to say a few words about him is absolutely, I think, uh, daring something, doing something, some daring task, uh, because to say about his commitments, his research, his work will require a lot of time. So, just with a few words, I'm saying a few words about him. Professor Mojumdar completed his graduation and post graduation in statistics from Indian Statistical Institute Kolkata. He was awarded the PhD degree in 1982 also from ISI Kolkata. Professor Mojumdar did his post doctoral work from University of Texas Houston. He joined the Indian Institute of Kolkata and is now the professor of anthropology and human genetics. unit of isi kolkata he is also the founder director of national institute of biomedical genomics in kullagi 
and uh, before i say a few words about uh, about his work his we can see that his scientific contributions to human uh, population genetics span a vast range from structure and and evolution of human population to genomics of disease and development of statistical methods for genomic analysis he is a uh, sir dc bose national fellow he is an elected fellow of all the three academies science academies of india of the world academy of sciences and the international statistical institute he is a council member of the human genome organization he is the indian national co co coordinator on the international cancer genome consortium he has served in the board of directors of the international genetic epide epidemiology society and was the founding chair of its ethics committee he has the he has worked for the international bioethics committee of unesco he is the recipient of several awards and some of awards and medals including the tuas biology prize dd billa award for scientific research ranbaxy research award in applied medical sciences and the new millennium science medal from government of india and uh, with this i uh, with this a very short introduction of uh, professor p mojumdar Partho P Mojumdar actually he is Professor Partho P Mojumdar. I would request, sir, kindly uh, to uh, deliver your speech and your talk, and we would we are all very eager. And again, sir, thank you very much for being with us, and we are all eager to hear from you. Before I hand over uh, or before Professor Mojumdar takes over, I would request all the participants. to disable their microphones and their cameras to enable the smooth running of the program and kindly don't write unusual messages in the chat box please refrain from doing such things just the chat box will be open and you can send in your questions and i'm sure professor mojumdar will be glad to answer some of your questions thank you all again professor mojumdar we are all now very eager to hear from you thank you very much i uh, really appreciate those kind words but most importantly i really appreciate being called upon to give this talk uh, on this uh, uh, specific day which is the national science day that's being celebrated all over india um i know that uh, you had a long day so it's uh, many of you or most of you must be very tired uh, please relax um, it's not going to be very hardcore science i'm going to tell you a story but uh, I do want to mention uh, a point uh, about the National Science Day. Although we celebrate the National Science Day, this is like taking the annual vow that we will celebrate science throughout the year. This is an annual vow that we take that we must not forget science. Science touches our everyday lives, and uh, this is really the day when we take this vow. It is important for us. to build the scientific temper to think scientifically and there is no other human activity which is more objective than science given the same piece of information anybody who is scientifically minded will arrive at the same conclusion that's objectivity in science and that's what we need to do in our daily lives we need to be objective otherwise uh, society cannot move on um all right so i'm not going to uh, spend a lot of time i too have uh, spent uh, the whole day celebrating science and uh, taking this particular vow that uh, throughout the year we will think scientifically and think rationally build a scientific temper and help public understanding of science which is so uh, crucial uh, especially at this juncture when not every everything that we are doing Uh, is uh, a completely rational or scientific all right so i'm going to share my uh, screen and uh, let me see um all right so i uh, guess you can see my screen um i've titled my talk as prints and hops 
uh, and I'm going to talk about the global journey of a mutant SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus. So as we know uh, that this particular coronavirus has made our life hell. Um, we, the, the coronavirus has made its journey throughout the world. There is no corner of the world uh, where humankind or human beings have been spared from being infected by this coronavirus. And so I'm going to talk about this global journey. And this global journey, in this global journey, the coronavirus has made some sprints and has hopped in some places. And what I'm first going to describe to you are these sprints and hops in different places and try and impress upon you that there is biology underlying the sprints and hops. And I will um, expose to you uh, what the biology may be. We don't, we don't claim that this is the only reason why there have been sprints and hops, but this may be one reason why and one um, important reason why uh, the coronavirus is able to sprint in some places and only able to hop in some other places. All right, so that's essentially um, the uh, purpose of this talk, uh, to talk about the global journey of the coronavirus and to tell you some aspects of, uh, of this global journey. I'm going to run out of time and therefore I first must, um, must acknowledge all of the people who have uh, done this work. Um, essentially, I'm like the bandmaster. Um, most of the work has actually been done by uh, uh, colleagues of mine, uh, many of whom are my former students. So it's really um, a very great pleasure for me to introduce them to you. They are like my, uh, my students and grand students. So it's a bunch of people who are my students and grand students who have made this work possible. Uh, the leader among them is Nidhan Biswas. Um, Nidhan uh, did his PhD with me and many some years ago and is now my colleague in the Institute. And uh, most of the ideas, most of the methods actually came from him. And uh, he's been uh, assisted by uh, Chandrika Bhattacharya, Anulabha Basu, Ornab, Chitrarpita, and Shobhi. Uh, also, uh, uh, in some portions, um, uh, very specific technical portions by uh, Animesh Singh. So this is, uh, these are the seven people and uh, myself who have, um, you know, worked in order to um, understand the global journey of the coronavirus, which is what I want to share with you. All right. So I'm going to um, uh, not go through this entire, uh, entire list of uh, dates and uh, events, but I do want to recall for you, most of these would be known to you, but I do want to recall for you for the sake of com completeness. Um, uh, in, Ch in China, in this place called Wuhan, uh, on December 30th of 2019, um, uh, pneumonia-like uh, cases arose and there were 27 of them and uh, it wasn't very clear what the etiology was, why these people developed the pneumonia-like symptoms. Um, and then, um, so, so these people were sick, they fell sick, and, uh, but yet it was not clear why they fell sick. Um, on January 1st, uh, the, uh, there, there's a huge uh, seafood market in, in this place in China called Wuhan. Um, Wuhan also is famous for two other things. One is that there is a, a fantastic virology institution there, research institution, and there is a fantastic um, uh, logistic or infrastructure uh, for holding conferences and seminars. So they have an international conference center, uh, a seafood market, and also um, a state-of-the-art um, uh, institution of research uh, in virology uh, on viruses. So this is this is uh, these are the three landmarks of Wuhan. So the human um, seafood market, which is in Wuhan, uh, was closed on January first because many people believe that it may have come from handling of seafood. Uh, on January seventh, within seven days, this novel coronavirus, which is SARS-CoV-1, was isolated. Uh, and in a, um, a remarkable time of three days, the genome of the coronavirus was sequenced. So the genome of the coronavirus, and I'll come to this a little later, the genome of the coronavirus is 30,000 alphabets long. So uh, the scientists were able to uh, sequence, meaning that they were able to uh, read alphabet by alphabet these 30,000 alphabets of the, that make up the genome of the coronavirus. And that's phenomenal because it was only three days after isolation that the genome was sequenced. Um, this coronavirus moved from China to outside of China, and the first place that it went to is Thailand. 
and that was on January 13th. So in about two weeks' time, the coronavirus uh, traveled from China uh, to outside of China, and that was the first uh, global hop that it made. Um, there was, uh, it wasn't clear at that time whether uh, the, the, there was any human-to-human -human transmission, meaning whether an, an infected human being can pass on the virus to another human being and how it could pass on. But then that was very uh, established uh, very shortly on uh, January, and, and then it began to spread. Once it was uh, clear that there is human, to, uh, human transmission, the virus began to spread and infect more people. Uh, the World Health Organization on January 30th declared this, uh, this, this was kind of an outbreak, but it soon became a public health emergency of international concern because the virus had moved outside, um, outside of China where the first outbreak took place uh, to Thailand and then from there to uh, many other places. Uh, so the WHO declared this as a public health emergency of international um, concern. On March 11th, which is about three months since its discovery, uh, it had spread so much that the WHO declared um, the coronavirus uh, or COVID-19, the coronavirus disease um, uh, that, that, that was discovered in 2019 as a pandemic, uh, which essentially means that it, it's spreading rapidly and it has spread to uh, all parts of the world or many parts of the world. Uh, this is 17th January when I actually gave this talk last. Uh, I updated this on 17th January and as you can see, a large number of uh, individuals, millions of individuals have been infected with the coronavirus and India ranks second uh, among all of the countries uh, in terms of the numbers of infected cases. Um, the number of global deaths, however, has been small relative to the total number of people who are infected. Uh, the coronavirus is um, uh, killing only about 2% of these in, of individuals who are infected. But 2% of a large number of global cases is also large, and therefore uh, one's concerned that there have been so many, over 2 million cases, uh, who, are, who have over 2 million infected patients uh, who have uh, died. And uh, that, that's of major concern. Uh, anyway, we um, do not like to see as many deaths from uh, um, an infectious disease. So, like I said, that uh, let me explain to you a little bit about this coronavirus. Not that you need to know uh, or, or remember all of this, but uh, there is one particular uh, region of the uh, coronavirus that I will uh, sort of uh, emphasize and home in. Um, this is uh, for those of you who are from a uh, biology background um, and know a little bit about the DNA um, and about uh, you know other nucleic acids. Uh, this is not a DNA virus. The virus contains RNA. So this is a, what's called a single-stranded positive sense RNA virus. And like I said, that its genome length is 30,000 nucleotides, 30,000 alphabets. Uh, it has a certain number of genes. Uh, it, it, it needs certain number of genes um, to be able to uh, lead its life. But uh, essentially, um, its uh, virus is like between a living being and a non-living being. Uh, a virus cannot reproduce by itself. It needs to enter uh, another cell, uh, which will serve as its host, and then it will use the cellular machinery of the host in order to uh, replicate, reproduce itself. Uh, the, the portion of the uh, virus that I will draw your attention to is called the spike glycoprotein. Um, this is what decorates the virus outside, those uh, beautiful structures, and that's the spike glycoprotein that I'll draw your attention to. Uh, when we compare, so one of the questions one has initially is, uh, we didn't have this virus. Where did this virus come from? Um, uh, so could it have come from some other animal that we know that animals harbor various kinds of viruses? So the uh, first question that one asked after this particular virus was sequenced on January 10th is, where did it come from? And we had a, a sequenced coronaviruses from various other animal species such as the bat coronavirus, such as the pangolin coronavirus. And then there were uh, earlier uh, two outbreaks uh, of coronaviruses in humans, uh, one in China in the same place, Wuhan, um, in 2003, which, is, uh, which was called as SARS-CoV-1. And then uh, about 10 years ago, um, uh, uh, seven years ago, um, um, another coronavirus, which is called uh, Middle East uh, Respiratory Syndrome, which caused a disease, respiratory disease, uh, and therefore this was called as the MERS coronavirus, 
So the SARS corona, SARS uh, CoV one coronavirus, the MERS coronavirus, and uh, also we have the common cold coronavirus, uh, which causes common cold, not the not the flu, but uh, uh, the common cold coronavirus. Uh, these are these these sequences were already available. Uh, if we have if this particular virus has evolved from a, uh, another virus, then we expect that this coronavirus's genome sequence will be very similar to that particular uh, coronavirus from which it has evolved. The uh, greater is the the time lag between the evolution or its um, ancestor and the current coronavirus, the smaller will be. Uh, the the uh, level of identity between the two genomes. So, if you look at the uh, level of identity among these uh, among the coronaviruses that have been found uh, in other animals and uh, also in previous human outbreaks, what one sees is that with uh, you know when one compares the SARS-CoV-2 with um, the bat coronavirus, you find. Uh, of the hundred uh, nucleotides of each each hundred nucleotides, ninety six. Uh, alphabets will be exactly the same between the bat coronavirus and the human coronavirus. We call this as a 96% nucleotide identity. Um, with the pangolin coronavirus, is it's 91%. Uh, with the previous human uh, <coughs> coronavirus, SARS-CoV-1, it's uh, 80%. Uh, with the MERS, it's 55%. With the common cold, it's uh, 50%. So the most likely um, uh, ancestor uh, ancestral coronavirus probably resides in the bat. That's where we find the highest nucleotide identity, 96%. Um, did the so as as many of you may know, actually uh, the humans do come in contact with the with the bats, and in China they come in contact quite frequently because uh, the Chinese uh, many of them actually um, eat bats, and so uh, in order to uh, they have to catch them in order to be able to eat them, and so they come in close contact with the bats. Here in India. We don't come in so such close contact with the bats, although with the cutting of trees, uh, we do find bat colonies on many um, buildings, especially high-rise buildings these days, that brings us in closer contact uh, with the bats. Um, did the bats uh, uh, contribute their coronavirus directly to us? The answer is probably no. Uh, and the reason why we think that the answer is probably no is because, again, uh, not, not very far from Wuhan, where the first outbreak of this uh, SARS-CoV-2 took place. Um, one morning, farmers found two pangolins um, who were dead, and they were dead not because they were shot or killed, uh, but they died a natural death, and uh, uh, there was a lot of froth coming out of their mouth. Um, they, they knew that it, uh, it seemed like it was a natural death, and they collected uh, the pangolins, took them to the animal uh, veterinarian, and uh, then they isolated coronavirus. They sequenced the coronavirus, and lo and behold, it had 91% identity with the human coronavirus. Incidentally, we are talking about uh, one single, two sequences being compared. One is the uh, SARS-CoV-2 isolated from one human, and uh, you know uh, the uh, coronavirus isolated from one bat. So there is some amount of variation within of coronavirus sequences within the bats. There is also some amount of sequence variations within the humans. So this 96%, 91%, etc., must be uh, taken uh, taken with a no, with you. You have to um, give a little bit here and there. So 96%, maybe 97% or 95%. So we're not very sure. So anyway, uh, the the model now uh, seems like the uh, bat contributed the coronavirus to the pangolin. The pangolin in turn in turn contrib contributed uh, the coronavirus that it harbored. Uh, to the human, so we believe that there was a, uh, th there was a, a species uh, crossover uh, from the bat to the pangolin to the human. So this seems to be the most likely model of the SARS-CoV-2 uh, evolution, or from uh, or ancestry, I should say. Uh, it, it there was animal to human transmission, but now uh, once it uh, got transmitted to the human, there is now human to human transmission, and uh, the coronavirus has spread very very rapidly. Um, all right. So uh, there's another another uh, specific uh, point that I wish to make. Uh, if you look at these sequences, so on the top right hand corner, you will see some uh, short sequences that are written, um, short portion of the genome where sequences are written. And uh, these are amino acid sequences, not nucleotide sequences. Essentially, what it shows is that in that particular region, uh, there is uh, there is one uh, specific position, amino acid position, that's marked as 614, 
that will occupy most of our uh, time today. That 614 position, as we can see, um, has uh, um, an amino acid that's uh, denoted as D in most of the uh, most of the uh, uh, in mo most of these species that you can see. It's uh, marked as amino uh, 614 D, and we will talk about a mutation that has led to uh, change in this particular uh, in the amino acid at this particular position. D denotes aspartate or aspartic acid. And this has changed because of a mutation, because of a um, nucleotide change, which is a random event. Uh, it's uh, changed this particular amino acid at this position from aspartic acid to glycine. So we call it as D614G. D, D is the ancestral um, uh, amino acid at this particular position, 614, and it's changed to G, um, which, is, which is glycine. So there was a uh, there's an amino acid change because of a mutation that took place at this uh, in, in, in the coronavirus and the position is 614. Um, like I said, that viruses cannot live without their hosts. To be able to re replicate, they enter the host cells and they hijack the uh, host cell machinery in order to replicate. And uh, we must remember that uh, viruses actually don't want to kill their hosts. We believe that if we have a viral infection, we are going to die. Um, but the virus doesn't want to actually kill their host. And the reason why they don't want to kill their host is because their ability to replicate will cease, will stop if they kill their host. So that particular host will no longer be able to transmit the virus if the host is dead. And therefore, for them to be able to uh, replicate and spread themselves, so this is like the uh, Darwinian evolution by natural selection, to be able to gain this selective advantage to infect more and more people, they really should not be killing their host. And this particular uh, virus, SARS-CoV-2, is a very kind virus. It only kills 2% um, of, uh, of people they infect. However, uh, previous coronaviruses have not been so kind as SARS-CoV-2, this particular coronavirus. So I said that uh, in, in 2003, there was an outbreak of another coronavirus in Wuhan, where of the 100 people who were infected, 11 people were, ki were killed, 11 people died. Uh, the MERS coronavirus was even worse of the 100 people who were infected with the MERS coronavirus, which is um, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, which took place in Saudi Arabia neighborhood. Uh, of the 100 people infected, 34 people were killed. Uh, the SARS-CoV-2, on the other hand, is now on an average killing um, only about two of the 100 uh, people it's infecting. So it's a fantastic uh, infector, so to say. It infects people very, very well, which means that they are able to uh, hijack the host cell machinery very well, replicate, and once they replicate in many, many cells of the host, uh, the host then in turn becomes a, a wonderful transmitter of the virus to another individual. So it's very effective um, because of its ability uh, to, um, to, to actually infect many host cells. Um, and then um, and, and not kill the host, uh, kill only a very few uh, people. Um, the uh, SARS coronavirus, as uh, we have all learned by now, um, actually um, prefers the lungs. That's where uh, the coronavirus mostly resides. But it also um, it also uh, infects or resides in other uh, organs of the body, such as the nasal passage. Um, and and uh, it's passed on through the stool and the sputum. So it it um, it uh, it probably uh, resides in other organs, but its most favored uh, organ is uh, is the lungs and the uh, nasal nasal cavity and the nasal passage. Uh, that's where it uh, uh, that that's where it mostly remains. Um, and uh, the the uh, coronavirus also we need to understand this because this is going to um, be a major part of my story. The coronavirus, uh, like I said, first needs to enter the host cell. To be able to enter the host cell, it first goes and attaches itself to the surface of the host cell. And this attachment is through a viral um, protein interacting with a, a host protein. And the host protein that this viral protein interacts with um, uh, is, the, um, is called ACE2. Uh, you don't have to remember the name. Uh, it's called angiotensin converting enzyme. It's expressed in plenty on the surface of cells in the lung. And uh, this protein uh, of the virus that interacts with ACE2, ACE2 is uh, called the spike protein. So the spike protein interacts with ACE2 
uh, and it binds to the uh, host cell surface. Just binding to the host cell surface is not good enough. It needs to break the cell membrane or fuse itself with the cell membrane of the host and enter the, um, uh, enter the human host cell. To be able to do that, it, uh, the human, uh, it uses uh, some of the human proteins uh, that are expressed by the host cell. And we will come to those human proteins. One of those human proteins is called Tempress 2. Tempress 2 allows uh, the fusion of the host uh, of the viral cell membrane of the viral membrane with the host cell membrane, allowing the virus to get into the cell. Why the human protein is helping the virus to enter its cell, we will never know. But this is what happens. It's helped by uh, a specific uh, protein called Tempress. How does it help? So uh, it comes. This this is a very interesting part of the story. Um, like I said, that this spike is a protein. Uh, it's called the spike glycoprotein. The spike glycoprotein has two subunits. Imagine, if you will, that it has like uh, two arms. And these two arms uh, uh, perform two different functions. And we have already talked about those two different functions. One function is that it goes and attaches itself to the human host cell. The second function is that um, the, there is a fusion of the um, viral membrane and the host cell membranes like that. The virus can enter the host cell. So these are the two arm, two functions that that are done by uh, that are performed by these two um, arms of the um, uh, spike protein. These are called subunits. One's called the S1 subunit. That in this uh, diagram on my uh, on the left column uh, shows attachment, which is essentially it attaches itself to the uh, to the host cell surface. And the second is uh, the S2 subunit, which is called uh, fusion, which is when uh, the viral membrane and the host cell membrane diffuse and the virus enters into the host cell. Uh, the S1 and S2 subunits, the two arms of the spike protein, are actually joined. And when they are joined, they cannot perform its, uh, uh, the, the function that it is supposed to. The two subunits are fused in some way. And this, uh, these two subunits must be separated for the spike protein, the two subunits of the spike protein, to be able to do these two different kinds of tasks. Um, this particular um, in breaking or cleaving, there is a cleavage site. The, the, the two subunits must be cleaved. And this is, this is, of course, a protein. And it is cleaved by what's called a protease. Again, for those of you who are non-biologists, you don't need to remember these terms at all. There is a pair of scissors that cuts the um, uh, region be, uh, between the S1 subunit and the S2 subunit sort of separates the two arms so such that these two arms can perform their two different tasks uh, independently. So this uh, uh, cleaving or this uh, cutting um, is like the pair of scissors is called uh, is a human protein called Tempress 2 and that's what will um, will actually cleave uh, the S1 and S2 uh, subunits and this is a human protein uh, it's expressed by the human cells by the host cells and we will have to remember that. All right. Um, so I've actually uh, said this, the Tempress 2 protein is a serine protease. Serine protease is something that cuts a protein. A protease cuts a protein. It's like a pair of scissors. So this is, this is what happens. Now, um, I, as I, as I uh, okay, so I'll, I'll come, come to this uh, protease and the protein part uh, a little bit later again. Uh, this particular coronavirus uh, very quickly evolved to uh, multiple subtypes. Uh, that means that the original coronavirus that was there in Wuhan, if you look at the 37, 30,000 um, alphabets, the nucleotides, that uh, uh, changes and these nucleotides change as viruses evolve uh, through a natural uh, process called, through a natural process called mutation. These um, uh, nucleotides change. Most of these changes are innocuous. They do no harm to the virus. The, the virus happily moves on uh, with those changes, carrying those changes on its back. But uh, sometimes these changes actually provide the virus uh, the capability to become more infective. Some of these mutations also kill the virus. So those mutations that kill the virus go away from the scene and therefore we usually don't get to see them. Those mutations, those alterations in their, in, in their genome that persist, that survive, are the ones that uh, are either innocuous or provides the virus with some uh, advantage. In this particular case, the advantage being that it will uh, either transmit better or uh, transmit better and in, therefore infect better or kill better. It becomes, sometimes it becomes more virulent. 
Uh, this particular coronavirus, as I said, is a very kind coronavirus. Uh, it's not very virulent. It only kills two of the 100 people um, that it infects. Um, so uh, it has gained a huge amount of um, power to be able to infect, uh, to be able to transmit and infect people. Uh, this is what we will remember. And by the time uh, from about uh, from uh, December, uh, December 29th is when it was discovered to by the middle of January or maybe the third week of January, uh, um, the sequences, the viral sequences already showed that there were 10 different subtypes of the virus, uh, meaning that there were mutations that had accumulated and that led to 10 different subtypes. When we got onto the scene, so we were, we are interested in genomes and we are interested in genetics. We mostly do human genetics. We are not very keen on studying uh, viral uh, genomes or bacterial genomes. But in this particular case, the world was thinking about these uh, viruses and there was this lockdown and we wanted, we, we got curious. So some of us uh, were able to use the internet to the advantage uh, to our advantage and understand how this particular virus was uh, spreading. And we made uh, a discovery that turns out to be important. And that's a discovery that I'll first um, describe to you. Uh, this particular coronavirus, so what is this? This is on the x-axis are dates. So you actually are moving forward from December 20, uh, from January 10th, when the first uh, first coronavirus was sequenced. We are moving into uh, um, February, March, and so on and so forth. So as one can see, uh, pictorially what this shows is that the coronavirus is spreading. So as you can see that it is spreading, um, uh, it's uh, rapidly spreading, it's infecting more humans, and it's not just infecting humans in, in, uh, in uh, China, it's infecting humans throughout the world. So it's spread, it's become a super spreader and it's becoming, it's spreading throughout the world. Um, we uh, looked at, uh, at that time, at that point of time when we uh, did this analysis, we had roughly 3,500. Uh, of these 30,000 um, nucleotide sequences, and we collected these data. We didn't collect it. The data were being collected by the respective countries and being deposited in a specific database called GIS AID uh, or Next Train. Uh, these are the two sister databases. We collected these 3,500 uh, sequences from this database that came from 55 countries, and what we found was a selective sweep of one particular type of the virus, which essentially means that although by the middle of January, there were 10 different subtypes, it was one particular subtype that was sweeping through the world. Uh, and uh, that particular subtype is um, the uh, uh, had this amino acid G at the position 614 that I spoke to you about. So the ancestral type was aspartate at this position 614, which is the ancestral type because it's present in the bat coronavirus, the pangolin coronavirus, the same aspartic acid is present in at that particular position. But in the SARS-CoV-2, most of uh, the ones that had spread had, had a glycine and that glycine mutation arose sometime between uh, uh, January 1st and January um, and the middle of January or maybe the third week of January. Uh, and then, then suddenly it had uh, assumed enormous power to be able to infect uh, lots of humans and spread globally. So this particular coronavirus was spread globally and we made this first discovery uh, and our, our publication was in May 2020. Shortly thereafter, two other groups made exactly the same observation. One came from Iceland, a group of um, uh, scientists from Iceland made exactly the same discovery. And uh, a third group that was a consortium uh, of scientists from the US and from the UK, they made this uh, exact same discovery and their papers were published in June and July. So May, June, July, three uh, months in succession, three uh, independent groups made the same observation and uh, we are happy and proud that we made this observation for the first time in the world. So this is, this, this is what we saw, that there was a selective sweep of one particular virus type, which is called uh, which is the glycine subtype at the 614 position, the um, ancestral strain, uh, strain had uh, the amino acid aspartic acid. Um, I'm not going so like I said, that 10 different types, these types have uh, certain names. Uh, don't, don't worry about those names. This is, uh, which date is this? This is 31st of March, 2020. Uh, each, each dot at the end, at the periphery, represents a virus, represents a viral sequence. And there are many, many viral sequences here. And this is the relationship among these viral sequences. 
A2A is the subtype that contains this mutation that led leads to or uh, that led to resulted in uh, the glycine amino acid at 614 position. Already by 31st of March, you see that more a little over 50 percent of all viruses, uh, all individual, all humans infected with the virus had this particular subtype. Um, which arose much later, uh, not much later, but later than the ancestral subtype. If we go forward in time, by early May 2020, you find about 75 to 80 percent of all humans being infected by this particular subtype. That's not the original subtype, but derived, evolutionarily derived subtype of the virus. Um, by July, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's getting to almost 100 um, percent. And so, so one of the things that we figured out is that this particular coronavirus that uh, has um, glycine amino acid at position 614 is an evolved uh, coronavirus, not the ancestral one. One ex usually expects the ancestral type of the virus to be uh, to spread throughout the world if it spreads. Uh, but this is a derived type. This is an evolved type of the virus that actually spread. So this uh, glycine. Uh, amino acid at position 614 must give this particular um, uh, you know, subtype some advantage to be able to uh, infect human beings uh, in, a, in a major way. And I will come to that in a minute. Uh, so this, this particular graph, uh, what it essentially shows, again, x-axis is time. Uh, and this is, I think, marked till about July. Uh, x-axis is time. And uh, the first panel, the top panel, is uh, pertains to Europe. And the second panel, the bottom panel, pertains to the United States or uh, North America. So what we see is that uh, by about the middle of March or so, end of March, uh, or um, nearly or beginning of April, nearly 100% um, of people who were infected with the coronavirus in Europe and North America had this derived subtype, the 614G uh, subtype. Uh, if we, uh, so we had a good, good amount of data from these two continents. And of course, the other major continent that's missing is Asia. And if you look at uh, Asia, we didn't have uh, samples from uh, Saudi Arabia and West Asia. We did not have many samples. We had samples from South Asia. Uh, we had samples primarily from East Asia, China, Japan, uh, Singapore, and uh, the Southeast Asia and uh, China, Japan. From India also, we did not have too many sequences at that point of time. And what we saw was a characteristic difference. While in uh, Europe and America, the virus was able to sprint, in uh, East Asia, the virus was only able to hop. Uh, and uh, that, that's because the red portion is the derived coronavirus, derived subtype of the coronavirus. As you can see that uh, it, it hasn't reached the 100%. And it was uh, going up and down. Uh, the prevalence uh, was of the virus was going up and down over time. So it was kind of hopping. It wasn't able to sprint as much as well. Uh, as it was able to do in uh, Europe and North America. So this, this is uh, what we observed, and it needed an explanation. We were unsure as to why it's not able to sprint through East Asia, why it's only able to sprint through uh, Europe and North America. I will uh, also bring, bring to the fore, if this hasn't um, you know, um, struck you yet, uh, that uh, you know, populations in Europe and North America are predominantly uh, are predominantly Caucasians. Their ethnicity is predominantly Caucasians, while um, in uh, Asia, the, the are, these are non-Caucasians and of mixed ethnicity, these kinds of ethnicities. So among the Caucasians, it seems like it is able to sprint, but among the non-Caucasians, it, it at best uh, was hopping. Um, on, the, on the 5th of May, um, as we made this observation, it's interesting that journalists were also making this observation. So, for example, Reuters announced that Asia coronavirus cases hit 250,000, but pace is much slower than, the, than, than in Europe or the U.S. Uh, the Reuters report further stated that the region where uh, COVID-2 pandemic started has fared better, which is, uh, which is in China, has uh, fared better overall than North America and Europe since the first case was reported in Wuhan on January 10th. Well, it was not reported on January 10th. It was sequenced in January 10th. Uh, it has taken Asia almost four months to reach the 250,000 infection milestone, a level that Spain is approaching in just a little over two months. So the pace at which uh, the, the, the virus is able to move 
um, is much slower in Asia compared to uh, even one country like Spain. So this and this is these are not scientists who are observing this. This is uh, these are science journalists who have uh, also made the same observation. I'll skip this slide. So the uh, question that we had is why is the coronavirus finding it difficult to sweep through non-Caucasian populations of uh, East Asia? Why is it sprinting uh, through uh, Europe and North America, but is unable to, uh, but is only able to hop uh, in East Asia? Um, well, as I said, that the spike protein latches on to the angiotensin-converting enzyme 2 protein on the cell surface to be able to gain entry, to be able to latch on to the cell surface and thereby, thereafter gain entry. Um, and I'm going to skip this. Uh, the, uh, there are certain variants. So there may be multiple reasons why this is happening. One of the questions may be that uh, perhaps the virus was able to latch on better because the human protein ACE2 had multiple mutations, which it does. But we uh, showed that none of these mutations were able to help the virus latch on to the human cell surface better. Um, just give me a minute. My battery is running low. So let me just, um, just give me a minute. Sorry about that. Um, so it was, uh, we, we showed that uh, mutations in the ACE2 gene is not uh, in any case helping the coronavirus latch onto the human cell surface better. Um, so we looked at uh, uh, greater detail, we looked at the protein structure and so on in greater detail. And lo and behold, what we found was that this uh, mutation that resulted in the glycine amino acid compared to the original aspartic amino acid actually produces a second pair of scissors. Remember, the first pair of scissors is called Tempress 2. The pair of scissors is required because uh, the S1 and S2, the two arms need to be cleaved such that they can uh, carry on the function that they need to do, which is, uh, you know, latching on to the human cell surface and then uh, fusing the two uh, cell membranes in order to get uh, for the virus to enter the host cell. So that those are the two tasks. And this task is accomplished, uh, is not accomplished unless the uh, two proteins, the two arms are separated. Uh, in the original ancestral coronavirus that, that has aspartic acid, there is uh, one pair of scissors which is held by uh, this particular protein called Tempress 2. Uh, and when there is glycine, in addition to this Tempress 2, there arrives a second pair of scissors in the same, around the same cleavage site. And uh, th that particular pair of scissors is able to help uh, the um, you know, virus enter uh, the human host cell more efficiently. So it's a, a larger number of cells are getting infected in the human host. It's able to uh, do it much, much quicker. And therefore, when it infects a human, when this subtype, the mutant subtype is infecting a human, it's able to spread, uh, so it's able to uh, replicate better within the human, within that infected human. And if, they, uh, if there is better replication within the human, then that infected human is able to transmit the virus with, uh, with greater rapidity and with greater uh, efficiency. So that's essentially what, what we uh, our discovery was. This second, uh, this second pair of scissors, the first pair of scissors is called Tempress 2. The second pair of scissors is called Neutrophil Elastase. The Neutrophil Elastase is a protein that's produced by the human body. And uh, in the, in, uh, it's also a protease that, that helps cut. That's why it's a pair of scissors. But um, it's, it's, uh, um, it's expressed by the human cell, but its uh, level of expression is kept in check. Why does it have to be kept in check? Because too much of this particular protein actually is harmful to the cell. Uh, it's again uh, um, expressed in plenty um, in, the, in the lungs. And therefore, if there is a lot of uh, uh, neutrophil elastase that gets expressed in the lungs, uh, because it's cutting proteins, it has a harmful effect. Um, so its uh, level is kept in check. And again, this is, this is human physiology. This is human genetics. It's kept in check by another protein called alpha-1 antitrypsin. So uh, the humans also produce another protein called alpha-1 antitrypsin. Um, um, alpha-1 antitrypsin keeps neutrophil, in, uh, neutrophil elastase in check. So we will remember that if neutrophil elastase is not kept in check, the uh, virus is able to find better gain entry into the human host cell better, but the human host also suffers. 
and uh, therefore um, uh, the alpha one antitrypsin actually uh, keeps the suffering of the human to a lower extent, but as a result also keeps um, the the level of uh, infection by the virus uh, uh, to a to a lower extent. So uh, let me uh, let me uh, tell you what what the story is. Uh, I'm not I'm I've already said all of this, so I'm not going to tell you all uh, explain all of that. So I'll come to this particular slide. Like I said, alpha one antitrypsin, uh, denoted as EAT, it inhibits elastase, neutrophil elastase around the normal tissue. So uh, it, the inhibition is required because neutrophil elastase is not always helpful. High levels is harmful to the human body. When there is uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, when there are there's low level of alpha-1 antitrypsin, then uh, um, neutrophil elastase goes up. So if neutrophil elastase goes up, this particular virus is able to infect more and more human cells, even though the human being is going to suffer a little bit because of um, high levels of neutrophil elastase. But uh, the, uh, there are, there are uh, this particular gene called serpin um, A1, which is what codes for, which is the gene that codes for or produces alpha-1 antitrypsin also has mutations. These mutations impact on the level of uh, protein that's produced by this gene, uh, that's encoded by this gene and that's produced by this gene. So these mutations are natural mutations and there are uh, many, many such mutations. In particular, there are two mutations that are of concern. One is called the Z mutation and the other is called the S mutation. When individuals have the Z or the S mutations, they produce lower levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin. Uh, and they become deficient in uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So I'll come to that bottom um, square or rectangle, the blue rectangle, which essentially uh, tells you the uh, story, the punchline of the story. Uh, lower levels of alpha-1 antitrypsin resulting from uh, mutations, naturally occurring mutations in serpin A1 gene, a lower level of alpha-1 antitrypsin leads to lower inhibition of neutrophil elastase which means that neutrophil elastase will be expressed at a higher level, which means that there will be greater level of the spike protein activation because this neutrophil elastase is the second pair of scissors that is cutting. And for activating the two subunits, you need this cutting, this pair of scissors. So there is greater level of spike protein activation and greater level of spike protein activation means that the virus is able to latch on to more cells with greater efficiency and enter the human host cell with greater efficiency. So there is higher level of infectivity. And uh, therefore, um, when there is higher level of infectivity, more individuals are getting uh, infected at a greater level and they're able to transmit uh, the virus or infect other people with greater efficiency. So there is better spread in the population. So this is what we understood from the biology. We wanted to check this at the population level. Is this really what's happening? Because there are some populations that are known to have high frequencies of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. So our biological model predict, predicts that when there is higher level of um, uh, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, there will be better spread uh, in the population, better spread of this mutant coronavirus in the population. So this is what we uh, found. That in uh, so the greens are um, uh, are the um, uh, D614 and the reds are the G614. So the reds are mutant, and of course, as you can see, that there is a greater um, frequency relative proportion of uh, G614, the glycine mutant, in Europe and North America, and uh, in East Asia, there is a relatively greater proportion. Uh, of uh, the D614, which is the ancestral type or the original wild type. Uh, what is it that we expect? We expect alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency to be higher in Europe and North America if our biological model is correct and to be lower. The deficiency must be lower in East Asia. Do we see that? And yes, of course, we see that. We see that strikingly um, well. So uh, the, the height of the bar or the, or the length of the bar uh, towards the right on the on the horizontal axis um, is uh, the level of uh, anti alpha one antitrypsin deficiency. So what we find is that the level of anti alpha one antitrypsin deficiency in Europe and North America is far greater than the level of anti alpha one antitrypsin deficiency in East Asia. Uh, in uh, in uh, East Asia, as you can see, that 
uh, this, this particular bar extends only slightly to the right, which means that most individuals do not are not deficient. Only a small proportion of individuals living in East Asia, only, most of them being non-Caucasians, have a, a, a very low levels of alpha-1 alpha antitrypsin deficiency. This is at a gross continental level. If we uh, split it out by countries, we see essentially the same, uh, same model. Uh, we see essentially the same phenomenon or the same uh, relative proportions. So um, uh, the, by, what, where we started with, we started with the question, why is it that it is not the ancestral uh, subtype of the virus that is spreading uh, throughout the world? Why is it that a mutant type is spreading uh, throughout the world? We, uh, that was the first observation. That it is spreading was the observation that we first made. Uh, we uh, noted that it is spreading better in uh, Caucasian populations than in non-Caucasian populations. We asked why. We then did the biology of the, uh, of the um, uh, mutation, and we found that there was an additional cleavage site uh, in the spike protein that helps the, the virus uh, um, enter the human host cell in a more efficient way. And then we figured out that this particular uh, you know, additional pair of scissors it no, is not always um, uh, helpful to the human body. And it's kept in check by another, called, another protein called alpha-1 antitrypsin. And then we were able to complete the story by looking at alpha-1 antitrypsin in different populations. Uh, and the prediction was that where there is greater alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, the spread of the virus will be uh, better. And that's exactly what we find even at the population level. So this, this uh, uh, simple question that we asked turned out to be uh, a very interesting uh, biological um, uh, um, set of facts that we unearthed in biology. And that those facts uh, resulted in um, a wonderful prediction. And we were able to validate that prediction by uh, looking at data on alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency from various countries, from various parts of the world. So we believe that the reason why it is able to sprint so well in Europe and North America is because there is higher level of alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in these uh, Caucasian populations, and there is much lower level of alpha-1 deficiency, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency in East, East Asia, which is uh, why it's not able to sprint, but is it's hopping in uh, in in the Asian continent. I, uh, yeah, this, this, this has just been published in um, Infection Genetics and uh, Evolution. So I will stop here. And uh, again, simple questions led to a very interesting answer. Again, I must underscore that we don't believe uh, or we don't claim, uh, I don't know whether we believe, uh, we at least don't claim that um, this phenomenon that we observe, that alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency is uh, a, a cause of um, the virus being able to sprint through Europe and North America and uh, is in, in not enabling uh, the sprinting of the virus in Asia. Uh, we really don't claim that this is the only reason why this is happening. There may be other reasons of um, uh, that, that's helping the virus sprint through um, Europe and um, North America and um, enables it only to hop through Asia. So I will uh, thank you for your attention and I'm actually happy to take any questions. I know that it's been a long day for all of you, um, but uh, if you have any questions, I'm absolutely happy to answer those questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Akash Babu, what did you chat box? Has there been any question? I mean, this chat box open it, na buzde paachi na. Akash Babu? Akash Babu? Akash Babu? Yes, the chat box is open. Akash Babu, could a question? I said chat box, I am to take the patina kitchu. No, no, there is no question as such. I say, but I mean, if anybody has any question, kindly unmute yourself and you can directly ask, sir, about the questions. Uh, 
if anybody has any questions sir ami ekta apnake proshno korbo sir and this way of course sir ami just apnake proshno korchi je sir apni to bollen je oder ei alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency ta onek beshi thake shei jonno oder caucasian der onek beshi taratari hoy sir ami to jak mane i have a very kharap idea about biology vision bad idea like sir etar ki kono karon ache why they have this रैंडम रिजन <laughs> थैंक यू सर इज देर एनी क्वेश्चन देखिए क्वेश्चन आज बोलता है Why are there no other mutations? Um, no, no, there are many more mutations, but like I said, that most mutations are innocuous. Most mutations neither cause any additional um, uh, efficiency for the virus to spread or uh, make it more virulent nothing of that kind so we do observe mutations but it's just that we are not interested in those mutations because that does not uh, lead to a phenotype so to say it does not lead to uh, any tangible impact on uh, the virus's ability to infect or kill so uh, we are not interested in that that's the reason there are many more mutations as a matter of fact i mean उटली Uh, there are some um, some other elements that are added. For example, uh, yeah, so the multiple things are added. Uh, sometimes it's even egg yolk that's added. So these uh, formulations or these particular proteins, usually these are or to date, of course, mRNA vaccines are there. So anyway, there are components in the vaccine uh, that are not particularly relevant to boosting the immune system, which is what the vaccine does. but uh, the ones the components that boost the immune system need to be attached to uh, some proteins for it to be made available to the human body and those proteins come from sources that may some individuals are allergic to for example some individuals are allergic to egg yolk so uh, that's the reason why uh, some in some individuals those who are allergic to some of the components of the vaccine uh, will develop allergic reactions it's not to the major component of the vaccine but the other component that stabilizes the vaccine formulation that's what we we think and we know thank you very much for your uh, patience uh, and patient hearing thank you sir uh, thank thank you sir i would now like request uh, professor putap chandra rai head of the department of mathematics to deliver the vote of thanks sir are you there yes, yes i'm i'm oh, sir no. uh, ma'am there is one more question if sir likes to take it uh, no that's a, no that's not a question that i would like to take there is no specific concern for the human po uh, indian population so i uh, would not there's no specific we still don't know whether there is a specific concern so there is nothing to nothing that i can actually provide an intelligent answer to 
May I start now? Hello, madam. May I start? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm good. There was another question uh, regarding the MERS coronavirus and its uh, virulence. Uh, I didn't read the last line. What was the last line? Can you show that uh, chat one more time? The MERS was more virulent and then it said something. The question I couldn't read. If somebody so, will read out the question. I'll read it out, sir, for you. Yeah. Uh, we have seen MERS was far more virulent than the SARS-CoV-2. What yes. may be the factors behind it? What oh, are the uh, factors that are behind yeah. it, sir? Again, uh, the again the different mutants. First of all, the MERS coronavirus and the SARS-CoV-2 are not exactly the same coronavirus. They are related, but it's not the same. The genome sequence of the MERS coronavirus is uh, quite different. Uh, it's only 80% similar, uh, or was it 55%? I forget. Um, so it, there is a lot of dissimilarity between the SARS-CoV-2 and the MERS coronavirus sequences. Um, so that's the reason. So the the MERS coronavirus may have had certain components. Um, in the genome of the virus that actually made it more virulent. Uh, and uh, that's the reason. So we are not talking about the same coronavirus. Different uh, viruses have different um, virulence, uh, even if they, are, uh, they belong to the same family of viruses, like the coronavirus family. I think uh, it's... Sir, on a good question, you have uh, now, I think, uh, Professor, uh, we can hand over the mic to Professor uh, Roy. Pratap Babu, kindly unmute Kore Jodi to vote of thanks to deliver Korean. Today is the National Science Day, 28th February. We are, we observe this day, this year also, this is a focal point to us. Future of STI, sexually transmitted infection, its impacts on education and skill and work. Last year, it was on famous women scientist. Uh, this year, we have from Bethune College, you have invited Professor Parthopi Majunda, distinguished professor and founder of National Institute of uh, Biomedical Genomics, Colony, West Bengal. The topics were, uh, his topics were spikes and hops, the global journey of a mutant cells of coronavirus. He nicely started with history, the recent history of global journey of coronavirus. And given the st statistics on 16th, uh, on 17th January, the infected number of people globally and about 10% of it's infected in India. And this is not the DNA virus. We come to know from, her, from him that this is the RNA virus. Uh, the spikes proteins play key role in the receptor recognized and cell membrane fusion process. Yes. 10 different types of, he has discussed with 10 different types and, and samples it has taken and their biological model, biological models. And from that model, he had concluded biological some facts and published their paper, some famous journal. Thank you, Professor Patsupi Mojinda for your nice and lucid lecture. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Sir, again, thank you very much again, sir. Thank you so much for being with us, Ivong. I'm sure all of us have enjoyed hearing from you and we've become, obviously all of us have become more knowledgeable about this. Uh, thank you again. Thank you all. Thank you. I thank also Brain Drops for the transmission for being, being the tech, looking into the technical side of the transmission. Thank you again all. Okay. So we all uh, come to an end of this very nice session. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much.
আচ্ছা কাইন্ডলি চ্যাট বক্সে একটু গুগল ফর্ম এর ফিডব্যাক ফর্মটা দেওয়া আছে কাইন্ডলি আপনারা সবাই যারা এসেছেন অল অফ ইউ কাইন্ডলি ফিল আপ দ্য ফিডব্যাক ফর্ম এন্ড সাবমিটেড সো দ্যাট ইউ ক্যান হ্যাভ দ্য ই সার্টিফিকেট কাইন্ডলি আপনারা একটু সাবমিট করে দেবেন আকাশবাবু আমি কি বেরিয়ে যাব Yes ma'am you can yes ma'am thank you ma'am yes you may leave ma'am oh. I'm there for another 15 minutes 10 15 minutes ha apni 10 15 minutes se amar asha korchi shobai er moddhe ekkhuni beriye jabe ha ha thik ache ami beri jacchi ha right ma'am thank you thank you ha thank you very much